Uh, well, um, the uh, coronavirus uh, has drastically altered the outlook for the European and world economy. It has also made this forecast particularly challenging. And so I want to uh, thank the DG ECFIN for the excellent management of this challenge. Uh, let me share with you uh, six key messages emerging from this forecast. First, it is now quite clear that the EU has entered the deepest economic recession in its history. The EU economy is expected to contract by a record 7.4% this year, 77 in the euro area, more than in 2009. 2009 contraction was around 4.5. In 2021, we expect a rebound of 6.1% in the EU and 6.3% in the euro area, not enough to fully make up for this year's loss. Second, both the recession and the recovery will be uneven. These aggregate figures mask considerable differences between countries. Third, inflation will also be significantly weaker. Consumer prices are expected to fall significantly this year, reflecting the sharp weakening of demand as well as the steep fall in oil prices. Fourth, unemployment is set to increase, though policy measures should limit its rise. The impact of the pandemic will be felt on the labor market, but timely and sizable policy measures from governments and EU institutions could help to limit job losses, but massive drop in hours worked are expected. Fifth, bold and necessary policy measures will cause public deficits and public debt to rise in 2020. Governments have reacted decisively to the pandemic by implementing fiscal measures aiming at limiting the social and economic damages. This will inevitably lead to a marked deterioration of public finances this year in all member states. Sixth, the risk to this outlook are exceptionally large, and unfortunately, they are to the downside. So let's begin to describe this uh, uh, general uh, situation. COVID-19 abruptly changed our previous outlook. Economic activity in the EU dropped by around one-third practically overnight. The disruption resulted in a series of shocks to demand, supply, industrial output, investment, trade, and capital flows. That said, once the pandemic is under control and containment measures can be progressively eased, the European recovery, the European economy, sorry, should start to recover in the second half of this year. But given the severity of the economic fallout this year, our economy is not expected to have fully made up for these losses at the end of 2021. Output at the end of next year is set to be about 3% lower than expected in our autumn forecast. All demand components will be hit hard by the pandemic, except government consumption there will be a sharp contraction in household consumption. Private consumption should recover gradually once containment measures are lifted. But this recovery is said to be incomplete. Restrictions in tourism, recreational and cultural activities are set to remain for longer. And uncertainty about employment and income prospects will likely make households cautious about spending for some time. Business invest investment is likely to take a double-digit hit, a double-digit hit this year. 
European exporters could be faced with a sharp drop of global demand and the possible disruptions to the free movement of people, goods and services. The global economy. The current pandemic is a truly global shock. Overall, global GDP is projected to contract by about 3% this year. Again, a sharper downturn than the one during the financial crisis. It is then expected to rebound by 5% in 2021. And global trade is expected to take an even sharper hit. World import volumes are likely to fall by more than 10% this year. The real-time real -time indicators uh, reveal this uh, shock. Uh, it is, uh, the, the downturn was so abrupt that it was not easy to have hard data capturing the impact. However, data available at higher frequency, such as daily electricity demand and air traffic, confirm completely the exceptional drops in activity in March as Europe locked down. And also survey data point to a sharp decline in activity. Flash indicators available for April reveal the magnitude of the downturn. The collapse is particularly visible for services and reflects the halt to travel, tourism and catering, while the declines in the manufacturing and construction have been somewhat less sharp. They also point to a record contraction. Financial market resilience has been tested. The shock led to a sudden reprising of risks in March. In Europe, equities and high-held corporate bonds saw the fastest sell-off in a century. This reflected the deterioration of the economic outlook, profitability prospects, and the severe liquidity dry-up that company suddenly faced. In euro area, sovereign debt markets, the outbreak in euro area sovereign debt markets, the outbreak brought an increase in spreads, pointing to investors' concern that the crisis could lead to divergences in the euro area and that the policy response be insufficient. The monetary and fiscal policy response globally and in the EU has been swift and strong. Unprecedented measures have been taken to contain the economic fallout and ease liquidity pressures. And these policies helped stabilize markets in April. So spreads narrowed for corporates and sovereigns and equity markets recovered part of their losses. The outbreak has also completely changed the prospects for the European labour market. The confinement has led to a massive drop in hours worked. Policy measures taken to mitigate the labour market include short-time work schemes, wage subsidies for the self-employed and liquidity measures for firms. These should help work to resume smoothly once restrictions can be relaxed. Assuming that these measures are effective, the fall in employment this year is expected to be more moderate than the decline in output and more moderate than in other parts of the world, if we look, for example, to the US. This will leave the number of employed people in the EU about 1% below the one reached in 2019. The EU unemployment rate is expected to increase from 67 last year to about 9% this year. But behind this uh, unemployment rate, don't forget that we will have a massive drop in hours work. Governments have provided, as you know, pro uh, sizable state guarantees for loans to firms and other liquidity support worth 22% of GDP. 
EU initiatives are complementing these liquidity measures for an, additionally, an additional 4.4% of EU GDP. These decisions are helping to avoid that firms' liquidity shortages evolve into a solvency crisis. Sizable discretionary fiscal measures have also been taken or announced at EU level for a total of 0.4% for EU and 3.2% of GDP for member states. As a result, the aggregate fiscal stance for both the euro area and the EU is expected to be very expansionary in 2020. Meanwhile, the ECB's broad range of easing measures taken in response to the crisis are expected to keep real short and long-term interest rates clearly in the negative territory over the forecast horizon. During the lockdown, as far as inflation is concerned, during the lockdown, some supply chain disruptions may result in temporary increases in certain prices. We have already seen this in the April increase in the prices of unprocessed food. But these effects are likely to be outweighed by a lack of demand translating into lower domestic price pressures. Hence, core inflation is forecast to decrease this year and pick up only gradually next year. Overall, inflation in the euro area is projected at 0.2% this year and 1.1% in 2021. In the EU, inflation is forecast to, re to reach 06 this year and 1.3% next year. A common crisis, uh, as the one we were affected by, uh, will have different economic consequences. How well countries emerge from this crisis will depend on the severity of the pandemic and the stringency of their containment measures. And it will also depend on their openness and their exposure to sectors that have been hit the most. Above all, the size of the pol policy support they undertake will be key. By the end of 2021, according to our forecast, only Germany, Austria, Croatia, Slovakia and Poland are for forecast to recoup the level of economic activity seen in the last quarter of 2019. By contrast, the level of output in Italy, Spain and the Netherlands is forecast to remain more than 2% below the end 2019 level. Investments is like, are likely to contract substantially. Faced with heightened uncertainty about future sales prospects, firms are likely to postpone or even cancel their investment plans. As it is the case for the economic activity as a whole, an incomplete and asymmetric investment recovery is expected across the Union next year. What is uh, something about the map of European growth in 2020? As I told before, all EU member states are forecast to endure a severe recession this year. Economic activity uh, in Greece, Italy, Spain, Croatia, and to a lesser extent France, are forecast to contract the most. Among the largest member states, Italy was struck first and most forcefully. The economy is expected to contract by about 9.5%, with containment measures now starting to be removed gradually, the economy is projected to start recovering from the second half of 2020. Nevertheless, Italy's recovery is forecast to take longer than in other member states. The pandemic has hit the Spanish economy about as strongly as the Italian one. Real GDP is forecast to contract by almost 9.5%, this year, 
with a sharp contraction in investment. Despite annual growth expected at 7% next year, Spain recovery is set to be incomplete. In France, the economy is expected to shrink by about 8% this year. The economy is forecast to start recovering gradually in the second half of 2020, and as for most member states, France is set to be supported by fiscal measures aimed at ensuring firms' liquidity and protecting employment. Finally, Germany is expected to endure a less steep contraction than most member states and recover faster to pre-pandemic outputs level. Still, Germany is set to experience its deepest recession since the war at 6.5% in 2020. The lack of demand and disruptions in value chains should severely hamper the country's export. So the aggregate, coming to the budgetary outflow, the aggregate fiscal deficit is expected to surge and to surge from 0.6% of GDP in 2019 to about 85 of GDP in both the euro area and the EU, from 0.6 to 8.5. In 2021, the deficit then forecast to decrease at around 3.5% in both areas due to the expected economic rebound and the cancelling of most of the measures. Consequently, the euro area debt to GDP ratio is projected to peak close to 103% in 2020 after having decreased for five consecutive years. It should decrease by about four percentage points, so to be around 100%, a little bit less, next year based on a no-policy change assumption. Let me stress that without these decisive but costly policy actions to contain the pandemic and limit the economic impact, the long-term budgetary impact of the current crisis would be worse. The most severely hit countries are forecast to reach double-digit deficit ratios in 2020 namely Italy and Spain, while France should be close to 10% of GDP. Deficit in Belgium, Poland, Slovakia and Romania are expected to exceed the EU average deficit at over 8% of GDP. On the other side of the spectrum, in Ireland, Sweden, Hungary, Luxembourg and Bulgaria, deficits should remain below 6% of GDP. Let me conclude on the risk, unfortunately, to this forecast. I say unfortunately because these risks are mostly concentrated on the downside. A prolonged or more severe spread of the virus would yield on an even worse downturn. Containment measures would have to be maintained or reinstated further damaging the economy and the rebound that we are forecasting for 2021. So, first of all, the evolution of the outbreak. Moreover, financial turmoil cannot be excluded if the liquidity shock hurting the corporate sector leads to unexpectedly severe solvency problem. Third, the recovery could suffer from insufficiently coordinated national policy responses or a too limited common EU response. Uh, this would increase economic, social and financial divergence and this would lead to serious distortions to the single market and our economy and monetary union. And finally, the pandemic could also trigger more drastic changes in attitudes towards global value chains and international trade and cooperation, leading to a rise in protections. These are the downside risks of our forecast. But let me end with two more optimistic messages. 
so to say, to upside risk to our forecast. First, the Commission is continuing to prepare further steps of our common response by acting together with a strong, well-financed and coordinated recovery plan, we can mitigate the impact of the crisis and strengthen our rebound. And second, given the huge efforts undertaken at the global and EU levels to develop a vaccine, a faster than anticipated return to a more normal economic situation would lead for sure to a more benign outcome than the forecast here. So thank you and I'm ready to answer to your question.